Okay, so now that we've gone over the, the theory of how these regression discontinuity designs work, now we're going to talk about how to actually measure the size of that gap, because that's what we care about the most. Um, that's how we make um, causal estimates there. Um, as long as we can, can validly say that the people on both sides of the, of the cutoff are basically equivalent, um, once we can make that assumption, then we can measure the size of that gap, and then that's our causal effect. Um, but measuring that gap is tricky because there's a whole bunch of different ways to measure it, different ways of drawing lines and, um, and measuring how big that gap is. And so, again, the main goal of this is to measure that gap. Um, that's our delta that we've been talking about throughout the semester here. Um, it's also our local average treatment effect. And this is different from what we've been talking about before with, with uh, randomized control trials and with uh, diff and diff. We were finding the average treatment effect, or the ATE. With regression discontinuity, we're not finding the average treatment effect for the whole population. We're finding the local average treatment effect for just those people within that bandwidth around the cutoff. And we'll talk um, in the next section about why that's important and um, the caveats behind the local average treatment effect versus the whole population level average treatment effect. Um, but that's, so keep that in mind. That's the thing that we care about the most is just the effect of those people around that cutoff within the bandwidth um, and we're trying to find that delta. Um, and so there's our picture again. And so as you can see here, the gap is very, very dependent on how we draw those lines. Um, in this case, these are just linear model lines. And so they, they fit kind of, they minimize the least square distance between all of the points, just like a regular regression line. But we could draw these in different ways and that would change how big that gap is. It might shrink it, it might make it even bigger. And so, um, we need to pay attention to how we draw those lines because the way you draw the line determines how big that delta is. Um, and so um, the type of line that you end up drawing um, matters a lot. And so kind of the best philosophy, as you'll see as we talk about this now, is to just draw a ton of different lines and see um, which ones lead to big size, big effects, which, one leads, which ones lead to small effects, and um, you don't selectively choose one, you don't choose the best, you report them all, um, but it gives you a good range of how big the causal effect could be. Um, and again, there's no one right way to do it. Um, you just kind of draw a bunch of lines and report them all and say that this is the general causal effect. So when you're drawing lines, there's a whole bunch of things you need to keep in mind. And so we'll talk about uh, three main things. Um, there's different ways you can actually draw the line using parametric lines or non-parametric lines, which might be new terms, but we'll talk about what these terms mean. Um, the way you measure the gap using parametric lines versus non-parametric lines is slightly different using R. And so I'll show you a screenshot of, of what you type in R, and then when we get to the R example, you'll see how to actually do it. And in your problem set, you'll be doing um, these measurements both ways. There's also considerations of bandwidth, um, where you have to choose how big of an area around the cutoff you're going to look at. You can have a super narrow bandwidth, you can have a wide bandwidth. Um, there's no ideal bandwidth. Um, you just have to choose what is most logical and go with it and maybe expand it, maybe shrink it to see how robust your finding is. Um, but it's, it's a fairly arbitrary decision in the end. Um, and then we'll talk about this fun concept called a kernel, um, where you can actually make some of your observations be more important the closer they are to the cutoff. Um, and so you can weight them differently. Um, we talked about weighting a couple weeks ago with inverse probability weighting. This is similar where some points are going to have more weight than the further away points and there's different ways of weighting it and so we'll, we'll look at that. Um, so with parametric lines, this might seem like a scary big term, parametric, but all it means is a formula with parameters and parameters just means numbers. Um, so if you go back to your eighth grade um, algebra, you had y equals mx plus b. This is how you draw the line. The m is your slope. The b is the y-intercept. You plug in numbers there and you can draw a line. The m and the b there are parameters. That's all that means. Um, we've seen this with STATSY equations where you have beta 0, beta 1, beta 2. Those betas are parameters. Um, and so you can draw a line with any of these coefficients there, and so that, that's all a parametric line means. So if you look at this graph right here, um, this is a whole bunch of points, 
um, but we can draw a best fit line here that goes y equals 10 plus 4x. So the y-intercept is over at 10, and then it's going up 4 over 1, up 4 over 1, all the way up to 400-ish. And so that's a parametric line. It's just um, you have a slope and a y-intercept. Um, not all parametric lines have to be straight. Um, they're often straight because the y equals mx plus b is kind of the simplest way of drawing a line. Um, and that's a straight line. But you can make them curvy if you throw in exponents or trigonometric functions. And so if you drew something like this, where you have an x and an x squared and an x cubed, you're going to get a really curvy line. Um, or if you do something wild like this, um, you're going to get, um, if you include the sine of x, you're going to get like a, a squiggly line all the way up and down um, the line. And so to show what that looks like, um, Here's a whole bunch of points, and it best fits with this 120 minus 3x plus whatever x squared. Um, that makes it curvy. It's still parametric. Um, there's just a whole bunch of different parameters there, but it's, it's still, like, it's a line. Um, you might have something like this that has an x cubed in it. Um, the more exponents you add, the more curves there are. If we, we could go to, like, x to the ninth power, and it's going to have um, a whole bunch of different turnaround points, it's going to be very curvy. Um, you can even add trigonometry, and so if you look at this right here, this has a sine function in there, so it's really wiggly and squiggly as it's going up. Um, again, that's, that has a formula to it. You can plug in any x value, and it'll spit out a y value, um, and so that's a parametric function. Um, and so that's what a parametric line means. It's important when you're doing these parametric lines to get them right um, so that they fit the data. Um, ideally, you want the, the line to fit the data as closely as possible. So if the data is pretty curvy, don't try to fit it with a straight line because it's not going to work. Um, so if you have a situation like this, um, um, that orange line there is curvy and it, it fits that data well. If you use that blue line, um, that's going to cause incorrect results because that's not actually fitting the data well. And so if there was a cutoff at 50, um, the size of the gap there would be totally off because that line doesn't fit the data on each of the sides there. Or if you had a function like this where it's super curvy, um, you can run a regression model that has x cubed in it. Um, and that's going to make it nice and curvy. If you use other functions that don't have x cubed, like x squared for the orange one or just a regular x for the blue one, that's not going to fit the data very well. Um, and that's not going to give you a good gap size in the end. And so you don't want to do that. Non-parametric lines are different. Um, you can probably guess from the title non-parametric. It means it's a line that has no parameters. There's no nifty coefficient that you can... Um, multiply by x and you can plug in whatever x you want and it spits out a y. It doesn't work that way. Um, instead, you use the data that exists to find the best line. And there's a whole bunch of different ways of doing this. Um, the most common way is to essentially have a window and you figure out the average number within that window and then move the window across. And as you move that window across the data, you figure out kind of the, the average level and then that's what lets you fit the line. The most common way of doing this is something called low S, um, which you've seen already in your ggplot assignments. When you do geom smooth, um, one of the default smoothing functions is low S, um, which means it's going to be curvy. It's going to try to fit all of the points well. Um, it stands for locally estimated or locally weighted scatterplot smoothing. You don't have to remember that. You can just Wikipedia that. Um, it's just a way of making curvy lines. So the way this works is if you have data like this, there's our purple line. There's no math formula to get that purple, that purple line. We have no idea how many x cubes or x to the fourths or sines or cosines. We can't figure that out. Um, there are fancy math um, services like Wolfram Alpha. You could potentially get a line, uh, a formula for that line, but it'd be really complicated and awful, and you don't want to do that. Um, so instead, this was drawn by just figuring out windows of those points and figuring out the average y value in each of those windows. And so one way of looking at this um, is with this animation here, you can see the darker the orange is um, with these points, that's how much weight each of those points are going to get. And so what you're going to see in this animation is it's going to move across and try to find the, the average y value within each of those points, and it's going to draw that line as it goes. And so you can see 
um, as you're moving across X, you're getting higher Ys, and then it's going to start dropping down the lower Ys, and so it's just trying to fit nicely across that whole range of Xs, and that's how it's drawing the line. Again, there's no math there, there's no formulas with letters, there's nothing like that, it's just fitting that way. Um, when you compare this with parametric lines, um, the low S curves fit a lot better. So you look here, the blue line is a, just a regular X um, with no exponents, and that's definitely not fitting any of the data. Um, if you look at the orange line, that has an X squared because the data is going up and then dropping back down. So a squared value lets you do that, but it's not quite fitting everything well. Um, but if you look at the purple line with the low S function, that's fitting nicely, and that's great. And so that's a good thing to use there. Um, so the way you do this, uh, the way you find the actual size of the gap um, with these parametric lines is you can use regression, just like we've been doing with all the other methods we've been talking about. Um, so the easiest way is you center the running variable. So in this case, this is our AIG example where we have a test. Um, and if you get above 75, you're in the program. If you're below 75, you're not in the program. So if we have a data set that looks like this with a whole bunch of rows for people who take the test, um, we have our running variable. So person one got a 69 on the test. If we center that, so we say 75, or we say, yeah, 69 minus 75, um, we get that they were six points below the cutoff. Person two was exactly at the cutoff. So, so their, centered their centered value is zero. Person three is three points above the cutoff. This person was 10 points below. This person was one point above. So you center that running variable. And so if you have a centered column and you have a column that indicates if they got the treatment or not, if they were in the program or not, you can run a regression um, that just includes the running variable and includes this indicator for whether or not they're in the treatment. And as long as you do that, the coefficient that you get for the treatment is your causal effect. So if you look at this R code here, um, this takes this hypothetical AIG program and it centers it. So it takes the test score minus 75. So we have a new column named AIG score centered. And then we'll run a model where we're predicting the final score based on the AIG score centered and AIG here, which is the true and false column. And so when we do that, we end up with these results here. We have an intercept of 63. So what that means is it's, it's where that red line hits the threshold um, at 75. So that means somebody who scored a 74.9 on the AIG test would have an average final score of 63. So that's what that is showing there. The AIG score centered, this 0.53, that means for every point that you score on your AIG test back in sixth grade, your final test is going to be 0.53 points higher. So that's that slope that we have. But then this, this coefficient here, this 8.47, that is the height of that gap um, right at the threshold between the red line and the blue line. That is our causal effect. So we can say that being in the AIG program causes you to have 8.47 points higher on your final test score. And so that's the actual size of the gap there, is that coefficient for AIG true. And if we look at the p-value, it is statistically significant, so yay, which is not surprising because it's fake data. Um, if you're measuring the gap with non-parametric lines, you can't use regression because you're not using formulas. Um, there's no math formula to get these curvy, squiggly lines here. And so to do that, you have to use a special R package called RD Robust. Um, that uses fancy methods to get the, the size of that gap non-parametrically. And so the way this works, you'll get, a, you'll get practice with this in the in-class example and with your problem set, but you have RD robust, you tell it your Y, you tell it your X, you tell it the cutoff, and then it will spit out a whole bunch of numbers and a whole bunch of output. The most important here is the coefficient there, um, and so that shows that there's a gap of eight points uh, which is slightly lower than what we got with the uh, regular regression, but um, still with like still fairly big, and it is statistically significant. If you look at the p-value, it is zero, so still a significant gap um, right at the threshold there. Um, so some other things to consider when you're making these lines is your bandwidth. Um, so the bandwidth is um, the area around the cutoff that you care about the most. 
Um, we talked about in a previous section that the, the observations far away don't really matter. Um, if you're trying to compare somebody who got 100% on their AIG test and somebody who got a 30% on their AIG test, that's not a really good treatment and control group because they're wildly different. Fundamentally, something happened. Like There's some big difference there. But if you're looking at people who scored like a 72 and a 78, those are fairly similar people. And so the observations far away don't really matter. Um, and so what we can do is create bandwidths, which let us make a window around the cutoff, and we limit all of our analysis to just those people. Um, so if you look at this, this is other data. This is not the AIG test. This is just random data I have here that I made. Um, but it shows kind of limiting the bandwidth here, where if we have a bandwidth of 5 in, this exam in the far example here, um, we're only looking at those orange points. If we have a bandwidth of 2.5, then we're looking at people who are just in this narrow band here. We're ignoring everybody else, just looking at those orange points. Um, there are fancy algorithms that people have written papers about for choosing the optimal width. Um, you can use those. RD Robust, when you run that in R, it'll choose the best bandwidth for you. You can also just use common sense, and this is helpful when you're communicating um, the results of your analysis to, to people. Um, so with this AIG thing, you might say, we'll use a bandwidth of 5, and we'll just say people who scored between 80 and 70, we're only going to look at them. And 5 just seems like a good logical number. Um, I think the ideal bandwidth that it spits out is like 6.48. And so when you present that to somebody and say, we used a bandwidth of 6.48, that sounds weird. So just like move it to 5 and live with 5. Um, one common thing um, that you can do with bandwidths is you can check the robustness of your results by um, using the optimal bandwidth, or the 5, and then double the bandwidth and expand it and look at people plus or minus 10 away from the, from the threshold and then look at people at half the bandwidth, so maybe plus or minus 2.5, and see if that changes your results. And if it does significantly, then that means your results might not be super strong. Um, if it doesn't change at all, that means your results are probably pretty robust. And so that's, that's a common way of doing sensitivity analysis is to, to change the bandwidth, do double the bandwidth, half the bandwidth, and kind of mess with that and see what happens. Um, the last thing you can mess with when you're drawing lines are kernels. Um, and so this, again, gets at the idea that you care most about the observations right near the cutoff. Um, the ones that are more distant, we don't care about so much, and so we can give them less weight when we're, we're analyzing how important they are. Um, and so a kernel is just a fancy calculus-y thing that you can do to assign importance to values based on how far away they are from the cutoff. And it uses calculus stuff. Um, so if we look at this picture here, it shows kind of three of the most common kernels that you can use with regression discontinuity. Um, the orange one here is the uniform kernel, where it means basically everything gets the same weight. And so this is the same as like not really weighting anything. Um, if you're one unit or some number of units away from the cutoff, you're still equally as important as the people right at zero. Um, a triangular kernel gives weight, a ton of weight, to the people right at the cutoff. And then it starts dropping off the further away you go. Um, the final kernel here, which has a cool name, the Epinechnikov kernel, is more curvy. And so um, observations right at the cutoff have substantial weight, but then those kind of further away start getting slower, or start getting lower weights, but not as fast as the triangular kernel. You can see they're roughly the same in this picture. Um, again, there's no ideal kernel you choose. You just do all three and see what happens and see how different the results are. Um, another way of looking at this is um, if we look at these three graphs here, so this shows uh, some regression discontinuity data. Um, the points here are sized and colored by their weight. And so if you look over at the rectangular one, all the dots are the same size. They're all the same weight. All of those points are getting the same importance. If you look at triangular, the dots right near the line have a weight of 100%. They're super important. And as you go further away from the line, they start dropping in importance and shrinking in size and changing color. The Epinechnikov model here, or the kernel here, um, the points right near the threshold, again, are important. But the importance kind of shrinks as you go out, but not as fast as it happens with triangular. Again, there's no ideal version. You just 
throw them all in and see what happens. So the moral of the story here is just try everything. Um, your estimate of how big that delta is depends on all these things. It depends on how you draw the lines, if it's parametric or non-parametric. Depends on the bandwidth, how wide or narrow it is. It depends on how you weight the things with your kernels. Um, moral of the story is just try a ton of different combinations and see what happens. Um, it really does matter though. So if you look at this fake data here, um, we'll draw a linear line here. And you can see that there is a gap, hooray. Um, so we do have some measurable delta there, but um, it doesn't really fit the data there. Um, the, it's curvy on both sides of the bandwidth, but the blue lines are fairly straight. So we could throw an x squared term into our regression, like square whatever the x is, and that'll give us curvier lines. Um, we can also limit this to a narrower bandwidth. Right now this is using the full data from 0 to 20. But if we shrink the bandwidth to 5, um, notice how the lines change now. Um, before, our delta was fairly small, but now if you measure the distance between the top blue line and the bottom dark blue line, that's a lot bigger than the, the distance that we had before. And so that grew because we moved the bandwidth in, which is probably more accurate than if we used the full data. Um, if we shrink the bandwidth even more and do 2.5 on each side, then we have this black line, which is pretty much the same as what we had with the 5 bandwidth. Um, which shows that it's, the bandwidth is important. We want to have some version of bandwidth, but it doesn't really matter if we do 5 or 2.5. The estimate is about the same. But we do want some bandwidth because if we go too far out, that shrinks our effect and it doesn't really fit the data. And so it, it really does matter um, how big you have the bandwidths and what you do with the kernels and how you draw the lines. And so um, all of that stuff is very important.